Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tea Time, which is a monthly gathering of the Open Textbook Network Publishing Cooperative members. Tea Time is really an unstructured opportunity to ask questions, get support, and project consultations so that you can move your open textbook projects forward. Um, the Open Textbook Network Publishing Cooperative was started in January 2018, and really what we are is a community of practice. We share suggested guidelines and templates through a partnership with Scribe. We offer a publishing infrastructure and training on particular publishing workflows, along with more broad publishing training. There's also customized project support and consultation, as well as a la carte access to editing, design, and production professionals. So today we're going to hear from Karen Bjork, who is the head of digital initiatives at Portland State University Library. She's going to talk about the latest publication uh, to come out of their initiative there, their 20th, I believe, as well as talk specifically about um, how it worked in the publishing cooperative and um, answer any of your questions. So Karen, I'm going to turn it over to you um, if you would just mind describing the project for us. Sure. So the project that we're talking about is a philosophy open textbook that was published through our publishing initiative called PDX Open. And PDX Open supports uh, PSU faculty to publish open access textbooks that are created specifically for the courses that they teach. Uh, we put out a call for proposals um, and then we also financially support uh, the authors during this process. So as Karen said, this is our 20th uh, open access textbook that we have published through PDX Open, but it is the first textbook that we've really been able to add sort of a more um, design and sort of uh, publishing feel to the book, which for us is really, really exciting because we have found that many of our authors have been asking for having sort of design services um, added to and being part of our publishing initiative. Um, so this book was designed specifically as an introductory uh, philosophy book. So that's just a little bit about it. And how did you come to identify and support this particular project? Uh, so the author had gone in and responded to our call for proposal. Uh, we have a committee and we actually have a criteria that each of the PSU faculty who are applying have to fill out and participate in. Uh, and so the author met all the various criteria in the fact that it's designed specifically for a course, that he has the support from his department or chair, um, and that we saw it as a need as well. He also had to demonstrate that he was going to be able to create a textbook um, rather than sort of a supplemental material or a website. Um, and so part of that process is actually we sit down, uh, the committee and myself sits down with the author and we talk about their project and we go through the ins and outs um, of what the project means, what their vision of the project will be, and then if it actually does meet our goals or not. And this particular project did meet our goals. So we were, uh, we were happy to support him in the endeavor. And can you talk a little bit about your role as project manager? Sure. So I work to support uh, the author throughout the entire project. So that means from the very beginning all the way to the end of publication. Um, and what I do is I ensure that all budgets and timelines are met. Um, we actually sit down and have the author sort of sketch out their budget. So we currently um, provide authors with $2,500, but we actually have been upping that amount just because we've seen that there's really been a need for additional funding. Um, but I sit down and we, uh, the author sort of, you know, provides sort of an outline of how they would like their budget um, to be spent. And then I work with the library administration office to draw up contracts, to verify that uh, work is getting done in a timely manner, to make sure that all contracts are completed, um, and to make sure everyone has been paid. I also work with the author to make sure they, to see if they have any questions, um, particularly about the process of publishing a book. So I do not 
talk to the author about the pedagogy. That is not where my expertise lies. I actually talk to the authors about copyright. What does it mean to publish? What kind of questions do they have? Do they need help in seeking out reviewers? Is there any way that, you know, we could provide that assistant? Um, so I meet with authors on a regular basis. Um, I actually then as well email them. We talk about their timelines, what's going on. Do they need to, you know, stretch things out or are they on time or on track? And essentially it just becomes this really close and intimate relationship just to verify and make sure that um, the authors feel supported and that they can get their projects done. Um, each of our projects, I usually, I usually work with about four or five authors um, at one time. So it is a lot to kind of manage um, and sort of juggle, but I do want to make sure that all of our authors feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one, um, assistance that, that, they, that we can provide for them. And in the co-op, we talk a lot about how to ensure something is a textbook and not a monograph. Do you um, have some pages you can show or talk a little bit about um, what was involved in composing the document and how you went about that? Yeah, so we do this uh, in our open textbook agreement form. Um, so each author is required to sign the form and it includes not only their timeline for when they want their manuscript there to be completed, but it also includes sort of agreements of what they will do. And one of the one of them is we actually added the agreement that authors will develop um, their text and ensure that they've have let me <laughs> <laughs> I got very distracted for a second. You can delete that part out, right, Mark? <laughs> um, Cut. <laughs> what? All right. So we have, we sort of say to them that the textbook can support the teaching of the entire course. Um, and so we define that as it has to contain a table of contents, the chapters have to be consistent with various elements and features. And those elements and features and what I'm looking for are sort of exercises, explanations of concepts, really visual clues that kind of support the teaching and learning. Um, and then it also needs to include footnotes and glossary. So it's not just a straight out explanation, it's really making sure it has those interactive components um, that, that students can really take on and, and see as part of their learning process, um, as well as to make sure that uh, it can be used throughout the entire course. So Portland State's on terms systems, and so like a lot of our authors usually end up having, you know, somewhere between an eight and a 10 week um, chapter book, and they use each chapter for each, uh, each, each week of the term. So, um, and so we, I have a very, uh, like in-depth conversation with our authors before they even sign our open textbook agreement to make sure they understand what it is they're creating um, and to make sure that it does meet and become a textbook. Um, and sometimes I do have to tell authors that, you know, the project doesn't meet our criteria or our requirements and it's just, you know, it's okay to tell people that this isn't gonna work. And, you know, what you wanna create is a website um, and that's not what we are looking at creating. Um, so we really do have really a lot of conversations before the authors even sign on. Um, and that textbook agreement form is actually really important so that authors have a clear understanding of what it is they're getting themselves into. Great, I'm sure we would all love to see the textbook agreement form. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see, I've got it actually up. I can, I actually have it up here. So let me see if I can share my screen um, with you. Hopefully this will work. Um, let's see. So uh, do you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, it's just a Google Doc that I use. Um, and it's just a basic, it's got your name, email address, and then we have the production agreement. Um, so we say the textbook will be developed for, and that's the course. Here's where we say the author will develop a timeline detailing the development of their text and will ensure that they deliver a completed manuscript. Um, and then down here, we have our definition of a completed manuscript. It's the can support teaching of an entire course, table of contents, of su su consistent chapter elements and features, footnotes and glossary. Um, we also say that the author will submit evidence of peer review. They will create an original work and not an adap adaption. Uh, we also have them agree to participate in a workshop 
um, as well as schedule at least two 60 minute project consultations with the project manager. And then they have to submit a written impact assessment of the OER during or after the term of implementation. Um, and then this is their timeline. And again, I see this as sort of a, a working, living timeline. Uh, we adjust this every single time that I talk to the authors, um, just to make sure that they have something to work towards. Um, and then we have the use of the book. Um, this is where the copyright, all the Creative Commons license goes into play. Um, and then we also have sort of um, the funding requirements that you know Portland State will pay them money. Um, so this is ours. It is not a legal document. We are not allowed to say it is, um, but it is really just something to hold the author to and to remind them throughout the project what it is that they are required and, and, uh, and what their expectations are. And I really can't say this enough, making sure that your uh, authors have very clear expectations before they start the project is really key because you don't want the authors going in thinking, that you know they're going to get a particular service um, if you can't actually offer that service. Um, so that's why I spend a lot of time with our authors before they even sign on to the project to verify that you know they are it's it it's going to work. So yeah, that that is really important. We hear that a lot. That it's good to clarify in the beginning, early on. Karen, if you don't mind dropping the link to that into the chat, I think um, sure. that would be great. Okay, and did you go back to my screen? Uh, yes, we are still looking at your Zoom screen. Oh, okay, so let's see here. How do I get back to me? It says main screen, so let's see here. Where am I? See the little green share square with the yep. arrow? Hmm. Here, I'm going to pretend that I'm going to share my screen and then that'll stop yours. Okay. That work? Yeah, now you're going to see my screen. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and we're back. Yay, sorry about faces, that. Faces, faces. Okay, um, let's see. Can you talk about how you worked with Scribe? Sure. Um, so, uh, poor Elvis, well, Thank you, Elvis. Uh, so poor Elvis has been hearing from me about this project pretty much since early August. Um, so I knew this project was coming down the pipeline. I knew that the author was getting close to being done. And I knew that it was going to be the perfect project uh, to test out Scribe. Um, just because the, the, you know, it was, it was a pretty big project. There were a lot of elements that the author wanted to add and, uh, I had just finished composition training with my staff, and so I was like, woohoo, perfect opportunity. Um, so I started talking to Elvis in uh, August. I had gotten some draft manuscripts, chapters from the author. So I actually sent those to Elvis and said, hey, here's sort of the draft. Here's what we're looking at. It's, you know, the, the entire book, I think, is like 15 chapters. You can kind of get a feel for what each chapter is like. Here's sort of what the author would like. And so then Elvis, you know, said, hey, let me give me a moment. Let's take a look through this, and I'll give you some um, pricing. And so that sort of was how the whole conversation started started. Um, I never told him exactly when I would get the manuscript to him. I just said, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. I had questions about funding. I wasn't certain at the time if the library was going to be able to support the additional funding, but I couldn't request additional money when I didn't know how much to ask for. And so I was really clear to Elvis. I was like, I really hope I can do this. I really hope I can get the funding, but I need all this information beforehand and, you know, hopefully you can help out. And he was awesome. He was great. He, he sent me all the information. There were no expectations that I had to get everything done by a certain time. He was like, just, you know, here's, here's what we have. We'll work with you when you, when your book is ready. And for me, that was just a really comforting idea because then I wasn't being, you know, held to anything at that point. I was still trying to figure out if we could manage all this and how it was all going to be done. So I really just felt that like support was, you know, perfect and just what I needed to move forward and talk to my dean about 
how to get the extra funding for the book. Um, and then really once we had the book close to completion for the composition, I then, you know, told, I gave Elvis like a timeline that said, hey, we should have this all to you by, I think it was at that point, like mid-October. We then started to work out a timeline with the author and then really started to get things, all our ducks in a row and, and everything working. Um, so it really was just a series of conversations, um, just connecting where we were and, and sort of what his expectations were and how to make sure we we met those so yeah um, and that's really how we we got started and that's closely related to the next question which is around um, what the budget was for this book project and then what the actual costs were sure um, so our budget was 2500 that's what the initial author got um, the author had decided to spend all of that money on himself uh, to create the book which was uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, it met our criteria, um, but it did not allow any, he initially was going to do the design for the work. Um, I always have um, some reservations when authors tell me they're going to do the design, but we, I didn't really have an argument for why he shouldn't. Um, and now I do, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> we, let's see, so Elvis budgeted, um, so he essentially sent us an estimate for all their services and then we could pick and choose which services we wanted to do. I had already told Elvis that uh, we were doing the composition, so he did not send us an estimate for that. Um, but for the editorial, so we had 15 chapters, that was, a, uh, what was it, 17, so $1,745. Uh, production and editorial included the composition cleanup, the copy editing, the accepting changes, and quality control. So that was all that Scribe did on that end. Um, and then the production, which was the design, the typeset, um, and then the one PP corrections. I'm not actually certain what that means. Elvis, what does that mean? That's first pages. First pages. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, I'm still learning. <laughs> um, and then quality control. And that was 851. And a lot of the production, that was a lot of back and forth between Scribe, myself, and the author. That's where a lot of the work really came into play, um, as well as with the editorial. But really, we had numerous back and forth um, at that point um, with it. And then he also did um, quote us for proofreading, which we decided not to do at $893. Um, the ebook conversion, which we did do, was 468, and then the scribe administrative fee was 468. Um, so the total of everything, had we gone with the proofreading, was um, 4,400 dollars, um, which was a lot. When you when we when I initially looked at, it, I was like, huh, that's kind of pricey. But then as I looked at the amount of work that was done, I actually thought it was, um, yeah, it was well it was well priced. I didn't feel like it was, you know, overpriced at all, um, particularly with the amount of back and forth and the amount of work that we did with working with Scribe and the author. Sorry, did I interrupt? No. <clears throat> Is there anything else you would want to add about um, your communicating and working with the author, how that went, how you kind of managed? You mentioned there was a lot during the production process. Yeah, so I really wanted to kind of talk about um, the composition piece, um, and then this kind of feeds into sort of the conversations and everything during the production. So as I stated um, this summer, I focused on training my staff on composition, and it was, I actually needed retraining as well, because after going through the first, co first cohort and really trying to grasp all of the concepts, um, and then having it be several months after the fact, I realized how much I had Forgotten. So I really needed to refresh myself at the same time. So it was a perfect opportunity to not only retrain myself, but then also train my staff at the same time. So we spent about a month, um, almost two months, focusing on composition, going through what it is, all the keywords, how, you know, how to do it. Um, so we were ready to sort of take on the composition when Jeff's uh, book came down the pipeline, which is also the other reason why I wanted uh, to send this book to Scribe was because we had done all of this training and I feared that my staff, including myself, would forget everything that we learned if we hadn't actually applied it. So 
we, the way that we ended up tackling the um, composition for this particular manuscript was that because there were so many chapters and it was overall a really large book, I didn't want to overwhelm just one person in doing this. So I actually broke the book up into three parts. And so I took one part, one of my staff members took a second, my third took, you know, the third staff member took the third part. And what we did was we composed our chapters separately, but we sent sample chapters to Elvis. So each of them sent one of their chapters to Elvis. Elvis looked it over and told her what, told us where our errors were, told us what we, you know, sort of had a lot of detailed explanations of why certain things should be this way versus that way. And so we took it as a learning opportunity and we met weekly and we went through the, where we were with our composition, what questions we had, but we also had to make sure we were consistent because there were three people doing the composition and we wanted to make sure that each of the elements were done exactly the same way. So we sat down for an hour, we went through our our chapters, our composition. We looked at the, um, the emails that Elvis had sent to us and we just essentially compared notes and made sure we were on the same page. But then we also discovered in going through the composition that the author had a number of um, issues with his manuscript. In particular, there were some copyright stuff that was going on that we had caught. So I ended up telling each of my staff to go and talk directly to the author and work with the author to figure out the copyright issues. And initially, I think the author got a little overwhelmed because there were three of us emailing him at the same time about multiple chapters. But I think in the end, it actually worked out better because there was a lot of back and forth between the author and my team member in order to make sure that everyone was on the same page, in order to make sure that all the information was correct, to make sure that the author's ideas were still there, that things hadn't changed, or that, you know, the general feel for the manuscript hadn't changed so, so largely. Um, and that, I think, worked out really, really well. Um, we probably should have communicated with the author early on saying, hey, there's three of us working on your manuscript. By the way, you might getting all these emails. Um, because he did email me at one point and was like, who are these people? Like, what's going on? So I had to like sit and explain it to him. And, and then he was perfectly fine and he was great and it worked out really, really well. Um, and then what was also good about doing the composition was that one of my team members also noticed that the author had like forgot a paragraph in his book. So while we don't read it, you still end up like looking it through and you're like, huh, that doesn't quite make sense. So she like went back and actually read the first part of the chapter and was like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a whole paragraph missing. So she had to email the author and say, you know, there's a paragraph missing. Do you need to insert it? And lo and behold, it was like three paragraphs that were missing. Um, and so we were able to fix that before we sent it and before our composition was completed. Um, so that was also really, really good. Um, and yeah, and Elvis like was always answering our questions and we literally took about two months to do the composition because I wanted to make sure that my staff didn't feel overwhelmed, that we could clearly get everything done and make sure that it was correct. I will say composition doesn't normally take this long, but it was our first project. So we really wanted to make sure. And then I took all of the the chapters and went through them and verified that we were consistent throughout the entire manuscript on our composition that we had actually composed each of the elements similarly. Um, so that, yeah, so it was, it was a really good learning experience. Unfortunately, now it's been a bit of a break and so we haven't had another book. Um, but hopefully since we've had that experience and all those emails from Elvis, we can go back and look through it and be like, oh yeah, that's what that is. Um, so that's been, that was really, really helpful. And it also saved us some money. Um, I'm not exactly certain how much composition would have cost, um, but it allowed um, us to feel like we were participating um, in the actual process of, of making sure the manuscript um, was sort of completed and, and getting the services needed, so. Great. And so the book is available online as a PDF, as an EPUB and Mobi, mm -hmm. um, which you have, you have made all those file types available before in your publishing program. Can you just highlight a couple differences um, between the co-op process? I mean, there's the composition as you just talked about, but any other things that you would note, you know, that are different since you've joined the co-op in terms of what you were able to do that you couldn't do previously? Um, so 
while we have some of the EPUB formats available, we were actually, we had to um, contract those out through, um, uh, so Portland State has uh, Ooligan Press, which is a, it's essentially a publishing services program through our English department and it's a graduate student program that teaches um, students how to become publishers. So we uh, had a con we had an agreement with Ooligan for one summer to hire a couple of their students to do EPUB conversion um, but it we were only able to get a few of the books done so it wasn't a general service that we were able to offer it was really trying to figure out if it was something we could do and the cost and how much time um, so with using um, Scribe, we were offering services we never offered before. All of our textbooks authors, they had to contract out designers. Um, we never knew the consistency, how, how good the designer was, if there were issues. Um, and so we could sort of help like facilitate the conversation, but I was never comfortable with making the final decision on should you hire this person over that person. So many of our authors actually did not go through any level of design um, on their textbook. A lot of them were self-design and it was just, you know, kind of taking a word file and adding a header or, you know, trying to, to make something um, like, or creating a, a textbook cover. But you can, when you look at our books, you can really see sort of of the difference between what a professional designer can do versus um, you know somebody who is not a professional and we also um, required all of our authors to send the books out for peer review but we were never able to offer any type of copyright or copy editing services um, I am not a copy editor you do not want me to copy edit your book um, and so there have been several of our books where the authors have you know have had grammatical errors and have needed to go back and I mean they've they've asked other people people to go and read through them, but it just doesn't have that, that same level and the language isn't as consistent. Um, and so for us, it's just been a really, as we keep and continue to grow our publishing services and as we're sort of moving towards expanding, um, you know, there are levels of sort of having our manuscripts look more professional and expectations from the authors that we just felt like we needed to meet that need. And we were not able to meet that need before we had joined the cooperative and started working with Scribe. And finally, what is advice you would offer others who are going to go through this process. Mm. I do have one other thing I wanted to show people. Unfortunately, it means I have to attempt to share my screen again. <laughs> do um, it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I did want to show a before and after shot um, of the manuscript, just because I do think it really kind of shows the elements in which uh, Scribe has, has added. So I've got here, um, I am actually going to throw. Oh yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, so I'm gonna attempt to share. So you all should now see my screen again. Um, mm -hmm. So this is just the first chapter. Uh, this is just one chapter. So this is chapter 11 and this is just the first page of the chapter. So this is the before um, and then this is the after. So you can see just the design elements, the coloring, the font size. You can see how the chart is now sort of more strategically placed in the text and, and it just gives it a more sort of professional polish um, and really does look like a textbook. And, and as we know, while people claim you can't judge a book by their cover, people do. Um, and we wanted to say we are claiming and we we stand behind that our manuscripts are of a high caliber our textbooks you know our authors create these specifically for their students and they are high caliber books that really deserve the attention um, and really deserve to get recognized for what the and the authors deserve to get recognized for what they've created and one of the things that i was always very sort of nervous and hesitant about was this idea of because the manuscript did not look polished and did not look professional that it would provide a false sense that the 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 text and the pedagogy was not at the same level um, and i feel as though by adding these design elements by verifying that the you know the book is well copy edited well written that it really just adds that that professional level and that 
it, it really clearly shows that these books are of a high caliber and that these authors do deserve all of the credit and all of the high reviews that they continue to get. Thank you for showing that to us. Yeah, and I stopped sharing. I did it right. Yeah, you did it. Yay! So um, your, your advice, Karen, what are your, my, my, your wise words? My wise words, ask a lot of questions. Um, uh, Elvis still gets questions from me, as I said. Um, and it's okay to not know. Like Elvis had sent me an email one time and I literally had to write back and say, I'm so sorry. I know what these words are, but I don't know what they actually mean in the context of this sentence. And he then, you know, put it, put it in a different way. And I was like, oh, um, so yeah, and also make sure that your authors have um, expectations of what it is they're getting into before you get started. Um, one of the things that we have done is we have a sort of an author manuscript, um, what to know as you start working on your book. And each time that we do our call for proposals or end it, it keeps expanding. We keep adding all this information for authors um, just because new things always keep coming up. So I always am documenting sort of, you know, what do I need to say to the author? When do I need to say this? What do I need to like target somebody at? When do I need to contact them? How do I need to check in? Um, and it's just really about making sure they're clear about their expectations and that no question is silly um, because otherwise I'd ask a lot of silly questions, but yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, because there is, there's a lot of uh, terminology differences. There's a lot of information about copyright. Communication. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Karen, for answering those questions and sharing the story of how this book came to be. Um, what other questions are out there? Or Elvis, do you want to chime in with anything from your perspective since you were the, the project manager on this particular book? Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate, right, that it's good to ask questions and the communication is important, especially uh, between project managers, especially if you're contracting out to us or to anybody else. It's important to have that, um, just have that path of communication, I guess is the way you would say it, uh, open and to always be willing to ask the questions and always be willing to say, you know, I don't know, or can you clarify because it's, it makes it a whole lot easier and it avoids any issues that may come up from misunderstandings, which often tend to balloon or snowball or whatever metaphor you'd like to use for that. So um, also I want to say that it wasn't just me. Um, I was the PM here, so I was the point of contact, but there is a whole team behind me, um, you know, making sure that the work that we do uh, and that we do for everybody who contracts out to us is, you know, perfect. There, there are people like checking and doing a whole bunch of stuff. So, um, you know, I by far am not a typesetter, so I wouldn't, don't, don't ask me to type set your book, nor design it. So um, I would say, yeah, that there's, um, you know, it's, it's a team effort, right? And that's not just for the people here at Scribe, but for, you know, Karen and her team and, you know, their willingness to just like listen and their willingness to like ask the questions and to push and to say, hey, you know, I need to know this um, because that, that kind of communication just makes it, makes the whole project go smoothly and it makes it a good uh, learning experience especially for the next time that a project comes up. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Thanks, Elvis. Emily um, asked Karen for a link to the What You Need to Know document, um, and Karen shared that in the chat. And it's also in our Author Guides and Manuscript Requirements module, um, along with some other examples in addition to Portland State. What else do you guys want to know? Hey, this is Anna. Karen, um, you mentioned that you do, uh, part of what you do is advising faculty on things like copyright. Um, what was your preparation? Do you have a JD? Uh, how did you prepare yourself to do that type of work? 
That is a, a good question. Um, so I don't have a JD. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that are knowledgeable in copyright, um, and I've taken a number of like courses on sort of copyright and what you need to know. ACRL does um, like a scholarly communications roadshow. That's super helpful um, when working with uh, faculty on copyright issues. So I mean, essentially, it really was just the basics of you know what do you need to look for what uh like what can you or can you not do and really what we started to do was we took just um we essentially like looked at issues that we've come across before um, and one of them in particular was like one of our authors wanted to use um, journal articles in their open access textbook um, and it, and they actually went out and attempted to get permission from um, various publishers only to realize that none of them were giving them permission and many of them were actually trying to charge them uh, you know a lot of money and so they were very confused as to like why this was going on and occurring and so I had to sit down with them and talk to him about like you know the idea that you can't just take an Elsevier article and put it into an open access textbook like you need to either look for an open access article that's going to meet your needs or you just need to point to it um, we also just kind of did a general fundamentals um, it was really about sort of the basic one of the areas in which um, I had to seek advice from was when it started to get into international copyright so we have a couple of our textbooks um, that are language textbooks uh, one of them is in particular Spanish, the other is French. Um, and so the authors were utilizing uh, primary sources from those countries. And thankfully with the French textbook, um, both of the authors uh, were from France and so were able to reach out to the French Copyright Office and get the necessary permissions. Um, so they did a lot of that work themselves, which was really fantastic. Um, and with the Spanish, we actually, I reached out to several people that I knew, one of them in particular had a JD, and said, hey, this is what we're thinking. Does this meet you know, the international copyright? Can you explain more? And so that was really helpful as well. Um, so a lot of it is just sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations, finding out where the author's at, what questions do they have, and really trying to like determine, okay, who do we need to reach out to? Because I personally don't want to um, give you know any type of advice that I'm going to get I want to make sure that you know I'm backed up by some reputable like person saying yes Karen this is correct this is what you can do because um, otherwise I will just say you know this is my recommendation but please like seek advice from others um, and it was the same we have a Russian textbook that we're currently working on and the author luckily has family in Russia and was able to go to the Russian copyright office um, and get all the necessary permissions um, from Russia in order to make sure and verify that they could use excerpt, expert, excerpts. Uh, that actually took much longer than anticipated, so that book is um, not close, is not quite yet done. But um, yeah, so it's, it's really about just kind of figuring out what are the kind of the common questions and then sort of expanding it out from there. Thank you. Yeah. And then Myra has a question in the chat asking about how much time it took for the whole process from first conversation or maybe from the full manuscript to the finished book. And I think, I think this is a little, and then this last question is a, maybe a little bit different. How much time did you devote to the work? So like both the project timeline and your Karen personal <laughs> time. Yeah. Um, so the project, uh, overall, it took uh, our author about two years to create the textbook. Uh, we like to give our authors two summers um, purely because of the fact that we can't um, we can't pay for the authors to not teach courses. So authors are teaching courses at the same time of writing their book. So we, they, a lot of our authors spend uh, their summers working on the book. Um, and then I had actually figured out. So in my notes, let's see, we. I started talk. We actually got the manuscript from the author. I'm trying to find where my notes are on this. Here we go. So I handed. So the the author sent us the manuscript for composition at the end of August. We completed the composition by middle of October. 
I then handed off the manuscript to scribe in the middle of October and I got the final files at the beginning of January. So it was quite, you know, it was a good six month uh, timeline from the time that we got the actual files for composition to the point that um, they were ready to be published um, in January of 2019. And part of the, the timeline and for the length of it is really because of the composition piece and having us take this on as being a new process. We also had to balance out um, our other work as well. So, you know, just trying to find time when you could sit down and devote to composition was a challenge for us as well um, at times. But we were able to kind of figure it all out and then meet and get everything done. Um, in regards to time, it's really tough to say. I mean, it's, it's my time devoted to this project has been increasing. I would say at this point, it's probably like 30% of my time. Um, and at times it feels like it's more 50%. Um, it really just does depend on what's going on and what's happening. Um, for a lot of these projects, I don't really, I send an email every so often just checking in with the authors. And then there'll be something where I'll have to spend a lot more time. So with the composition, I would say, you know, that I was spending 60% of my time getting the composition done. Um, but then the other time with Scribe, it was maybe like 10% because I was just answering questions, sending emails, you know, sort of the going back and forth. Um, so it really does decide how much involvement you want. Um, we didn't have to do the composition, but we just, I just felt like um, that my, it would be really good training uh, for my staff, really good sort of professional development for them and to learn a new skill set. Um, so I did it sort of for that as well. That answer your question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Myra? Yes. <laughs> this is the question. Oh, good. And then Emily also uh, typed a question in chat. She's asking if you can talk more about resources you needed. For example, you mentioned your colleagues and some of the staffing resources you had in place. Were there other resources you found you needed? For example, did you have any specific tools for project management? That is a good question. Um, so resources needed, I, I really needed money. <laughs> um, it really was about just the getting the extra funding. Um, so the textbook publishing, because we've been going since 2013, we have a lot of mechanisms already in place. Um, so one of my colleagues uh, is sort of our, you know, copyright expert. So whenever I have questions, I always just go to her with um, questions, as well as some of my fellow colleagues who work at different institutions. So I just reach out to them. Um, and then for the sort of the budget and the admin piece, so we actually have a budget analyst um, here in the library. So she set up an Excel file, um, a sort of a Microsoft, uh, actually Google sheet that she had set up that works for the way that she handles all the budgets. And so she and I meet on, we meet about every two weeks and we sit down, we go through budgets and we figure out where we're at. And we have multiple spreadsheets that we've utilized. Um, and then for just kind of tracking, um, I have my own type of like Google document that I have each of the author's timelines. And then I just populate my calendar and I have all these notifications throughout my calendar. It says, oh, you got to reach out to this person. You got to do, you know, talk to this person. And so that's how I've been able to do it. Um, I know that there are some really great project management tracking, um, but I uh, got busy and never had time to actually investigate them. And so this was sort of my way of, of doing it. And it's, you know, I, I use my calendar every single day and I like that I can just get the pop up right in the morning that says you need to contact this person. Um, and I did the same with the timeline with um, with Elvis was all of it was in my calendar. Um, and so I would get reminders of, oh yeah, this is due. Like I'd even have reminders of, you know, email the author, make sure they're still on time. Like, you know, check in with Elvis, make sure this is good to go. And so that's sort of how I how I was able to do it. Um, I'm not necessarily saying it was it's the best way, but it really does um, seem to work. And then having the Excel spreadsheet and directly with our budget analyst is is great because she actually tells me 
what I need to do and when. Um, she, she deals with all the budget. I just ask questions and say, okay, can this be done? When's the contract? And she draws up all the contracts. So she has all that level of expertise. And so she communicates with the, the, the author um, or anybody else that they contract with. So she directly communicates with them about the contract and any questions they have. And I'm just CC'd in on the conversations. Elvis, what's your project management tool? So here at Scribe, we actually have our production system. Um, and so we have, essentially, we keep records of all the notes that are related to a project. So for example, anything that Karen sent me and said, oh, we need to do this with, um, you know, with the book, or this needs to be added, or this needs to be taken away, that is actually uh, noted. So that really can be done anywhere. Um, we just like keeping a note system where every record has, you know, everything allotted. And um, along with that, we also have, um, there's time tracking software, and you can find that online. Um, there's there's some open source stuff too um, out there. We have our own time tracking um, here in the system that sort of just tells us um, like, hey, this is estimated at this much and we've spent this much time and whatnot. So uh, we really do depend on that. But much like Karen, we use uh, the Google Calendar, um, email, uh, that's very important. And like I said, just keeping good notes um, of everything going on at the same time. So that that is going on at the same time, excuse me, uh, because when things get, you know, hairy, because sometimes they do, um, it's better to, you know, be able to just go back to your notes and say, oh, I know that I have to add this or I have to change this um, at this stage. And that was noted, you know, two months ago. And now we're finally at the stage where this needs to get changed or something like that. Um, so, yeah, so good notes, Google Calendar and uh, Gmail. Those are good project uh, managing tools. I also found folder systems. So each time uh, Elvis would send me a version of the manuscript, um, I actually had a new folder set up. So I had a whole like hierarchy of folders. And so I knew which version and then I would label and date them um, just in case for some reason I needed to go back and look at it or I needed to resend it or, you know, and for me also, it's just a way to kind of see the progress um, and to show the progress. So yeah, so I still have all of those those files um, set up in a folder system, which I think worked really well as well. Right. And if I can plug Wednesday's class, um, when we talk about project, project management, um, we actually talk about folder structure because as Karen said, that's very important to be able to not only have backups, but also know which file you're working on. Um, because as Karen said, all these files were like separate chapters and they're floating around and you know some of them were sent to me so I can look at them and some of them were you know the um, her team members were working on it so all that floating around without proper folder structure is like a recipe for disaster yeah. so the best thing to do would be as Karen said have folders uh, folders where you can say okay I know I'm working with these and then when I get a new set of files I'm dropping it into this other folder um, because I know that I'm not now the previous ones are foul they're they're just as reference or as backup if something goes horribly wrong. So. Always good to have backup for when things go horribly wrong. <laughs> Elvis, you said that and just my mind kind of exploded. Mm -hmm. That was my pause. Um, any other questions for Karen or things about her experience you'd like to hear? Or for Elvis or for anyone here for that matter? Alrighty, well, uh, we'll see many of you on Wednesday. Please join me in celebrating this milestone and congratulating Karen for her first co-op. And my group. I didn't do it alone. <laughs> and her group. Karen <laughs> it, was, it was not just me. I, I think my uh, team members would uh, dislike me immensely. Of course. Like, of if course. I took the full credit. <laughs> Karen and her team, Elvis yeah. and the scribe team. Um, and the co-op team. I mean, it's a group effort. We're uh, supporting one another. And so um, thanks, Karen, for sharing all of your experience with us. And um, we'll see this uh, live on as we uh, go forward. You're welcome. Right. Oh, and I am excited. Uh, we are going to be moving forward with our next book soon, actually. Elvis, we got the, the go-ahead from the original copyright owners. So, yeah. And so what's, what's this book, Karen? So this, book? this is an ESL book. Um, it's essentially helping in 
uh, make sure that ESL readers have um, reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it was the, they're giving their copyright over so it can be openly licensed? No. Uh, so they, the author modeled the book off of another book. Um, and this other book, the, the authors um, gave their permission for, you know, for her to model their book after and, and sort of gave their blessing. So we just got the final blessing from the authors. I so, see. yeah, because the, uh, the original authors had published their book back in, I think, 2011. Um, and so they, they had their own copyright. They, they self-published it. Um, and so we were just crossing our T's, dotting our I's, and verifying that everyone was happy and good to go with the, with the book. Because it's, it's modeled after that original book. So, Great. Yeah. <clears throat> so it should be good. It should be exciting. Yeah, well, stay tuned. Um, I just little comments. Sorry, I didn't open up my screen um, so you can see me. But anyway, I just got an email today for a book that I just um, handed in a chapter for an ACRL book. Um, and it was due, we handed it in the 1st of August. And I just got their publishing plans. And they hope to have it out by the end of 2019 or early 2020. Wow. And it's just, you know, and it's now, now I know what they're talking about, you know, like the, the different pieces that they're doing, but it's like crazy that it's taking that long. A long timeline, yeah. So. That's good, good for comparison, just kind of. That's kind of why I was asking this question was, yeah. like, you know, I was going, oh my God. Is it really? Yeah. And it can run the gamut. And of course, you know, authors and other people involved in the process can also impact that timeline. If you're asking for feedback and you don't hear back for several weeks, that's going to change. Um, that's going to change your ideal timeline. Too. Now, the manuscript has all been in since August. And, you know, we've gotten our corrections in and all that has been. So it, that has all been there for quite a while now. But it's mm -hmm. now those... What is it called now? Pro editing design and production? Production piece. Production, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and some editing still to be done too, but a long yeah, haul. I mean, and we had to adjust our timeline because like the author went on vacation. So, you know, when we were having these conversations, that's part of having the conversation is to tell the author, here's the timeline. Let me know if there's conflicts. And, you know, luckily we did that because all of a sudden the author was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to be gone for like two weeks and I'm not going to think about the book. So you need to give me an extension. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Not a problem. You know. All right. Well, speaking of timelines, it's almost at the hour and um, we probably have lunches and meetings to go to. Thank you again, Karen, and to everyone for coming and see you all soon, I hope. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.